8330. Yeah, hello? Is Steve Hawley there? Uh, he's, he's speaking, Joe. How are you, sir? It's good to hear you. I am well. How about you? Well, I cannot complain. How about what's going on? I was uh, looking on, online on allmusic.com, and I was reading this review of uh, The Reluctant Dog. Oh, I am The Reluctant Dog. Oh, so it was a self-titled uh, bio biographical album. <laughs> Actually, it was uh, titled after my, uh, my beloved uh, dog, Oliver, who was the hardest dog in the morning to get out and the hardest one to get back once he was out. And I realized that uh, he, I, I shared a lot in common with him. So was he in New York with you? Uh, he was in New York with me. He's, uh, he's left us, I'm afraid, but uh, not forgotten. That, that, that's so sweet. Uh, very few dogs have an album by Steve Hawley titled with them in mind. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, uh, that's, uh, that's the first and last, I'm pretty sure. So let us ask you, what was the demo that got the deal for the reluctant dog on Angel Records? Angel Air Records? Angel Air Records, yeah. It's, uh, Peter Purnell uh, has a company. It's kind of a, a boutique label in, in UK based on the, uh, in uh, Yorkshire. And um, it came about because you know, I'm a drummer, I'm a fledgling piano player and uh, wannabe songwriter, and I've always written songs, and I just decided one day um, that I would record the ones that wouldn't go away to the best of my ability. In other words, the songs that stuck in my head, I figured, well, perhaps they're, they're the best, the cream of, the, of my crop, so to speak, not to compare to anybody else. And uh, I went ahead um, and started work on that, and played a few of them uh, while we were touring England with Ian Hunter and Mick Rouse was uh, uh, in the band at the time and uh, it was called the Taking the Mick Tour I think and uh, <laughs> he, I was playing the songs he said uh, he said well uh, who's singing I said well it's me well, who wrote the songs I said I did and he said well who's playing the instruments and I said well everything without strings is me i.e. pianos and drums and stuff and he, he said, right, could you mind if I play this to somebody? And he played it to Peter Purnell, who was a friend of his, and releases his uh, material. Um, that's Mick Ralphs, of course, from original Mark the Hoople fame, and then later on Bad Company. And uh, he played them to Peter, and Peter said, well, I don't usually sign uh, brand new material, but it sounds like it fits the genre of my label, and that's what happened. So they were meant to be demos for somebody else to record, and they wound up being to date my first and only solo album. Now, did you really sit in America as well? Um, <clears throat> well, that was the intention, but um, uh, Peter, on his own admission, didn't really have the ability to, to release well in, uh, in America. And at the time, my, my business advisors said that they would prefer to procure a different, uh, a different label for the U.S. And uh, while I was at it, if I could also have Canada and Australia and Japan. And Peter basically said, well, uh, no contest, uh, Canada, America, uh, no contest, Australia, but Japan, I do quite well in. So we relinquished that. And then, um, <laughs> then the fine print meant that the album had to come out simultaneously at exactly the same time, day, and hour as the UK release. Otherwise, one would usurp the other to the limited amount of copies it may or may not sell would be, uh, you know, just not available if it so it was impossible to pull off to tell you the truth. So the answer to your question in short is no. It was never officially released in the US. Now Peter's a wonderful guy. I love the stuff he puts out. Yeah, um, yeah, me too. And I'm reviewing a lot of stuff for um, Eagle Eagle Vision. Uh, Carol Kay, the promoter, has Eagle Vision and I, I just reviewed the Rolling Stones double vinyl Texas uh, Some Girls Texas nineteen seventy eight. Wow. So the Stones were able to cut this deal with Universal Music and still be able to license to Eagle Vision. Isn't that amazing? Well, nothing surprises me these days, to tell you the truth. I think um, I, I understand uh, less and less on a daily basis as to what's really going on. But I know um, that uh, you have your uh, the, the, the finger on the pulse, so to speak. So I know uh, you'll be far more ahead of this game than I am. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. But it... What I know as the music business and what I grew up with has changed, um, and I'm not quite as flexible as I'd like to be. I'm, I'm kind of stuck in some of my older ways. But, um, you know, that's just the comfort zone thing. But I respect it, and I, I think in its own way it's the same as it always was. It's just uh, 
you know, the technology has enabled so many people to brand themselves, and uh, we don't need the, uh, the the companies and the spearheads. But I, th I think some of the vision went out of it a little bit too with that. That's my own. Uh, well, it, it is amazing, like you say. You're right because, uh, and I, if I, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you my perspective. I think Please. we're back to uh, 300 years ago where an artist had to get a sponsor. So if you're I don't care which artist, uh, like, you know, Rod Stewart had Hovan, right, on his tour. Uh, you really need to get that sponsor to do your art, and you strike a deal, and you own the masters, and you migrate them like Bowie and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles do. Uh, you know, the, it's funny, the Jimi Hendrix catalog went from UMG to Sony, and the Rolling Stones are now on UMG, so Universal gave up Hendrix, but they have the Stones. So these, these labels just fly around, I think the Stones were on Virgin EMI before that. And they migrate the catalog, and they add the bonus tracks. So they're creating a new product out of the old. Yep. And, uh, you know, so with the Reluctant Dog, you can put a booklet together, two chapters of your book, the Reluctant Dog CD, get Dunkin' Donuts to be the sponsor, and you can migrate it <laughs> over to Eagle Vision, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the thing for me was I, 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 I toyed with the idea... Uh, you know, in, in the edge you go, well, I don't know who would care about this, but over the period of time since that record's been released, which is about nine years, or escaped, whichever way you want to look at it, um, with uh, over that period of time, I'm still, I can still listen to eight out of the 13 songs. So I thought, you know, possibly here is the thing. I've written four or five new songs, which I think would still fit this. Maybe I'll do that, and I'll put that out as an EP everywhere else it was released, and add it to the album here, and officially release it in the U.S., so I'd perhaps have an album where I could listen to all of the songs. I, <laughs> I'm sure that's the same for everybody. After a while, you get tired of uh, some of them go, oh, why did I do that? But, um, you know, you, I, in the end, I don't know. I'm going to see you on Saturday night at the Paradise. I'm going to bring some Buzzy Linhart records. Good and, man. You were with Buzzy Linhart at the Denny Lane gig in New York uh, right. six years ago in October. Right. Um, right. Buzzy's company has an album, and they re-released it legally by rearranging the tracks, and they created a new product, and they call it Buzzy's Buzzy, and now he can legally put it out and license it. Even though it was on a major label, they have found a loophole that they were able to work. My goodness. I'm going to give you another loophole, and this is going to blow your mind. Have you heard of Wolfgang's Vault? Uh, I have, actually. Bill Graham I was I Wolfgang. I'm trying to figure out why, but I have. That's not the first time I've heard anybody talking about that. So, yes, I have. All right, so but Wolfgang's Vault is the Fillmore East and the Fillmore West. Okay. Bill Graham's real name was Wolfgang. Okay, now I'm getting it, yeah. So some millionaires behind Wolfgang's Vault, and they have the rights to the Bill Graham stuff. Now... As you probably are aware, the record labels, you know, the ones you were signed to with Wings and um, Kiki D and Elton John, the, the label deals probably said for the universe, that was what our Motown deal in 1986 said, the universe, but they weren't aware of flash drives. This is fascinating. So Wolfgang's Vault did a box set of the Jefferson Airplane on flash drive, and they mailed it to Marty Ballon. They were legally able to put their concerts out on flash drive as long as they don't put it on compact disc or on vinyl or on... Here's, here's the rub with that. I have contracts that I sign copies of them. I appreciate what you're saying. It depends on the wording of the contracts. I have... Uh, I know for a fact that most of my contracts say known or otherwise unknown. Ah. Any, any, and, and it pretty much covers everything. I've looked at those. Uh, not not specifically geared towards my album, but to contracts that I've signed for release by other major artists. And even back as far as the late 70s, uh, the contacts I have uh, say universe, known or unknown, and also um, methods of, of, of uh, delivery, uh, known or unknown, at the time. So it pretty much covers everything. Wow. I wonder how they were able to get around it with the flash drive, because Sony has all the Jefferson Airplane Masters, you know? That would be interesting to know. Um, I have, haven't really got a thought in that direction. I, I, that's the first I'd heard of it, to tell you the truth. So 
I'll, uh, I'll do some in-depth sticky picking, as they say. Yes. So there's two angles here that people uh, are, are beginning to work with, which is the flash drive and then the rearranging of an album that might have been lost in the shuffle. And I guess there's a way to copyright it and reown it, the masters. Uh, and I'm not, and I'm not sure the technical thing. And I, I don't want to speak out of school. So, but I know they did everything by the book. So uh, there are ways to look at this and for artists to resurrect their material. It sounds like something that will only be done once to me and that the, the loophole will be closed rapidly. Um, it's almost like, <laughs> almost like those old tax deals where you could, you could leave everything to your dog. <laughs> oh, well, like Helmsley. Helmsley. <laughs> What's her name? I don't know why it reminded me of that. Yeah. Uh, the richest dog in the world passed away. Yeah. Leona Helms, Hel Helmsley. You know why I can't say her last name? Because well, Sherman Helmsley and Helmsley, I confuse. Yeah, yeah, okay. George Jefferson was Hemsley, and she's Helmsley. Ah, ah. So, so now the big question, Steve. How was the European tour? Magnificent. I always have a ball there. Uh, Ian's on uh, rare form. Uh, the band was fine on all six or eight, depending on what you want to call it. No, it was it was tremendous. Uh, I love going back and see old friends, and of course, for me, there's the added bonus of touring my home country, which is uh, which is always great. And I took a little ten day vacation at the end to just uh, digest it all, and uh, it's fantastic time, fantastic time, and uh, yeah, great. And we've still got a, a few more now uh, for the years out, and a few more on the west coast next year, and so all good things, all good stuff, and. Uh, Pleasure to be playing the songs on the record, and it, it's it's interesting too. Something that came up uh, in my mind, anyway, from playing the new album uh, when I'm president. We record all of the songs now by rehearsal, and then go in and record them in the studio. And we did this record pretty swiftly, or recording pretty swiftly, I should say. They're not exactly records anymore. But um, the fascinating thing to me was, as soon as we got on stage with the songs. The arrangements fell into place more easily and, and things that were uh, sort of struck me as being wrong at the time or could have been better they all it all comes into place on stage and in the uh, years ago we had the benefit you could go out and you could actually tour the new material before you recorded it which is impossible now because it's on youtube the next morning uh no matter who we play in front of so that's one of the disadvantages of the new world is that um a lot of the time, the preparation we have with new songs that would take place in front of an audience is a thing of the past, if it's, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, and, and, and all of a sudden, we started playing some of the songs, and I said, oh, it's so obvious. Why didn't I do that on the recording? And uh, it's, it's amazing how often that happens. So that's one, one of the things I miss. Um, but that's been going on for a while. I mean, people would leak tapes, obviously, as soon as you held, had some kind of concealed handheld recording device this has been going on with anybody that's interested but the, the ability to actually put it up in video the next morning for everybody to see or within minutes of the concert being completed it, it's it's extraordinary i mean it's great in its own way but it's devastating in other ways but um it's a small point but it's something that's that makes a big difference i think um puts the onus on the creative uh, juices in the studio to be absolutely as best as they can and 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 very often the hindsight is oh that could have been so much better this way uh, but the moment's gone you know but then you will have the fixed product and you can always do it later on stage and so you have both that's that's true that's true and uh and of course even even the other side of that coin is sometimes the very first time you play a song is the best you ever play it as well and that might not necessarily be in the studio that could as 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 happened a couple of times was in his house <laughs> so, I mean in that, in that particular instance we could have did, done with somebody with a little held, held, handheld device but um, I don't know it's just the, the European tour was magnificent people were great um, and just very receptive the album became top 20 in Scandinavia and, uh, and made a little chart nudge in the UK and a little chart nudge for the first time since the 80s in the US so uh, what can be said about that? We had a ball. And it's a great record. You know, um, I wish that it had gotten more traction for the presidential campaign. Uh-huh. Well, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is, and we are who we are, and uh, 
we do what we can. I mean, but no, but I, I wish that one of the presidential candidates, you know, Mitt Romney spent $17 million on one consultant for the uh, technology, which failed him on, on, the, on the final day. The technology crashed. It was based here in Boston, and they paid $17 million. You know, for $1 million bucks, they could have put on when I'm president on all the commercials. Wouldn't that be great? You know, uh, it, would, it just made perfect sense, but uh, logic out the door. Uh, did you ever meet John Lennon? I never met John Lennon. I, uh, I'm afraid to say I, uh, I have met all of the other Beatles, or had met all of them, and uh, John was uh, the one... I never met from there. The reason I bring him up is uh, I believe Instant Karma was meant to be an instant record. And where he rolled out of bed, wrote the song, they ran in the studio, and it took them seven days to get it out, if memory serves. Uh -huh. So the British copy had a John and Yoko mix, and then Phil Spector did the final mix, so they pulled the British single. Uh, but you can't really tell the difference, but there are two mixes out there. And John Lennon had this instant record, instant karma. And I wonder how we would feel today where it really is happening. You write a song and it, you put it on the internet instantly. You could record live onto the internet and it's out there as you're doing it. I think he would absolutely would adore that, actually. I mean, I, I have somewhere by buried amongst my archives a little, a little comment he made, which is, uh, see, I think I have it verbatim. He said, all over the world there are people humming into tape recorders. I just want to bring them out so they can all hum together. <laughs> ah, that's great. <laughs> and I, 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 I seem to remember that. I've got that somewhere. I, I do have a past collection of stuff. I don't know how. People sort of tend to, tend to give me things along the way, and I'm never quite sure what I've got. One guy came up to me last year and um, at a concert in Hoboken in New Jersey, which was unfortunately just devastated with the Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I don't know who he was. I can't remember his name. I don't even know if he introduced himself. And he handed me a disc and said, um, you probably have all of this, but just in case you don't, I, I, I'm going to give it to you. I have never seen a collection like this in my life. It's, when I put it into the computer, it, it just goes on. It's just pages within pages, and it just opens up. As far as I can tell, it's got everything I ever did in my entire life on this thing. It's extraordinary. It really is. And uh, I've no way of thanking him. No way. No way of knowing where he came from, really. And I just thought he was going to give me like, some concert footage, you know, either concert footage or audio tape from the 70s. But no, no. This is uh, it's superlative. It's a ridiculous collection. So you, now, can, you can build on your website. You can build now archives. Yes, if I was clever enough. I'll have to send it to Joanne in England. She'll take care of it. Ah. <laughs> I'm I'm really useless with that stuff. I, I I have to confess. I wish I were better, but I I am uh, I am a, a little bit uh, all thumbs when it comes to the internet. I'm afraid. I'm but people can go to steveholly dot com, or they can go to Facebook Steve H O L L E Y, and there's a page for you up there, right? There is indeed, yeah. Yeah, and and there's a MySpace too, I think. Yep, there is. I was interactive for that a little while, and then it uh, it all got a little hand to hand. Joanne Rishton, I don't know if you've met her but she takes care of it for me and, uh, and she's in in the uk and and i think does a pretty damn good job as far as i can see and uh, i will get more hands on myself but uh, most of that is run by her i have to confess and uh, i do what i can but i i spend an awful lot of time working and thinking and writing and i if i get i find if i get locked into it in the morning i'm there all day and then half the night as well and i don't achieve anything else so I tend to steer away from it a little myself, I have to confess. I remember my, my comrades in the, in the rap band with Ian Hunter are there constantly. I, I don't think they even sign off ever. They're Twittering all the time. They're Twittering from the stage. Twittering on uh, Facebook. It's, it's, it's miraculous. Now, here's an idea for you. Um, I do two websites for Bobby Hebb, bobbyhebb.com and sunnythesong.com. Uh -huh. So in order to, to really keep things moving, I have a blog. And the blog, when I, uh, like Sophie, uh, this woman is doing Sunny. So I interviewed her, and I'm going to interview her on the show next week. But I put my interview up on Bobby's blog spot, and then the web, the designer has it automatically go to, the, in a few hours, it pops on a bobbyheb.com and Sunny the song. So you could do the Steve Holly blog and just do a paragraph every day, a little diary. 
and then it goes to your website and automatically the website will just publish it at a certain point. Well, I'll bear that in mind, Joe. I can't promise anything. No, but it'd be cool to, like, from the, you know, from the tour, Steve Hawley starts, you know, oh, Mick Ralph's jumped on stage, you know, something like that. It would, it would be good. I think Ian takes care of that with his horse's mouth, um, which is pretty much exactly what you're, what you're talking about, and people can actually write in and get a response for him, and that's all monitored. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great. You know, I, I have a couple of people that, are, that uh, would love to uh, take all this responsibility on on my behalf, but I, and I, I have to confess that steveholly.com, I, I, I reinvest in that every year, and I really have done very little. It worked well, nothing, to be honest. And uh, I, I, I suspect I'll get around to it at some time. Right now, every day is consumed with uh, with living, and I, 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 I just don't find the time for it. It's incredible. But uh, I, I did remember trying to get out of Facebook when it first started up, and it copied my address book and uh, sent Yikes. friend wishes to everybody. <laughs> I went to bed with about 15 and woke up with 2,700 and something. <laughs> I love it. It's great. But, uh, you know, I'll get there. I'll get there. I promise. Well, here's a funny story. I'm going to, you know, tomorrow or Saturday, I will edit this and have it up on YouTube. Okay? Yeah. And I put up Burton Cummings of the Guess Who. He came to town. I interviewed him. Yeah. So uh, the Burton Cummings, I, I talked to him about These Eyes. He just got an award for These Eyes, his big hit. First big hit. Yes. And um, it had 40 hits, and the next thing I know, it had 640 hits. And I'm thinking, what's this, a glitch on YouTube? How'd it go from 40 to 640? I did a Google, and Burton Cummings put it on his own Twitter. Tweeted it out there, and 600 people jumped on it. It's amazing. And it's, it's incredible what happens. I was talking to somebody, I, I, I'll give you info on this uh, at some other time. I, I, I've been proceed, proceeding with some work uh, with a guy in New York City, who just told me and delighted me and surprised me. I, I'll tell you about the details of it later rather than now because I have to confirm all this. He's telling me we had 540,000 hits on a piece that we did. Now, I know, is that possible? Well, that's very possible. Uh, on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah, you played with McCartney. You played with Robert Plant. You've played with uh, all these amazing people, Elton John. They get millions and millions of hits. Uh, so, yeah, 540,000, that's, that's modest, Steve. In a month. That's pretty good. That's very good. That's, um, yeah. y that's, that's, good. that's very good. That means a lot of eyeballs are watching you. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I think I'm a very small part of it. The song itself, I'll send you the song <laughs> in, a, in a few days. I'll, I'll get permission to send it to you. You tell me what you think. It's, uh, I think it's a little questionable politically, but uh, it seems to have... Uh, tickled some people's fancies anyway so I, it's, I find it astounding it's interesting it's interesting i was merely a uh, you know a, a side man in that and i didn't expect that kind of event or attention and i doubt that it's me that's drawing it i think it's the title but as i say i'll let you know about that yeah the titles do drive them the titles do drive them yeah yeah but yeah, yeah could well be we've got about 60 seconds left could you say this is steve holly on visual radio this is steve holly on visual radio You've been visualized. It's going to be a lot of fun to see you Saturday night at the Paradise. It's December 2nd? Uh, December 1st. December yeah. 1st. Wow, it's the first day of December. First day of December, Saturday, yeah. The Paradise Theater. Yeah. Um, you haven't played there as many times as I. I've played there 49 times. Have you really? Yeah, but I haven't played there in about a decade. But in the day. I think I, I, think I played there five times maybe total. I have more fun going to watch you play. <laughs> it was fantastic last year. It's going to be great this year. I know it. I'm really looking forward to it, Joe, and it'll be a pleasure to see you there. And thanks for, for having me on board this evening. That's great. Boston loves Steve Hawley. Hey, lots of love, Joe. I thank you for everything. All right. Great. you the best. Good night, Steve. All right. See you then. Bye. Steve Hawley, the views and opinions on visual radio are mine and my guests. And not necessarily those of Jeff Dearman and the Wing Camp staff. Thank you, Jeff Dearman. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, everyone. It's the last show of November. Steve Hawley on Visual Radio. Frank Delastrito. We'll be back next week with Sophie and more film reviews.